We are going through the gospel storyline. I hope you are beginning to believe that the gospel is drama. There is uh, God saying things and doing things. And we have talked about the world that God created, about Adam and Eve uh, placed there as uh, his uh, uh, authority, uh, mediating his rule. Uh, we've talked about uh, the flood. Uh, we've talked about Abraham. Uh, we've talked about uh, Moses, the uh, Mosaic Covenant, uh, the promised seed, uh, David. Uh, last week, we talked about kind of the downer, the, the hope dims. And it seems as though the, uh, 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 the hope of, of uh, the people of God is not going anywhere. Well, it's into that hopelessness. And you think now, uh, the people in Israel and Palestine were under Roman occupation. They were not fun characters. Uh, they uh, uh, faced all kinds of issues and problems. And it's at that very point, I think of the verse in Galatians, in the fullness of time, uh, specifically at the very time that God ordained, something happens. Now, we've been talking about all these things that have happened. This is really the climax of everything. You know, you, you can't appreciate this if you haven't followed that pattern. But at the same time, all of that in you know, as a support role to get us to this point. Uh, I had a, an opportunity today to talk to a, a friend of mine in, uh, in Indonesia that uh, is a missionary. And uh, it's kind of neat now, you can get on FaceTime and from halfway 11 hours from us, we're actually talking back and forth. And we're talking about, again, what do people need to know to hear and to understand the gospel? And what do they need to know about the Old Testament to make Christ meaningful? And uh, you see that in the Apostle Paul, that when he went to the synagogue, he assumed that they knew about creation and God and the covenants. But when he went to Mars Hill with the Athenians, his approach was very different. He had to begin and tell them who God was. And so all that we've gone through, and, and we've rushed through this, and there's so much more that could be said. Next week, we're gonna look at the new covenant as it's inaugurated by the Spirit. Jesus, we're gonna uh, look at how Jesus fits into the new covenant in his life and ministry at the end. And then two weeks from tonight, we conclude with the final curtain, uh, heaven and earth merge together. Well, tonight we're gonna talk about the incarnation. Let's take a minute and break the word down. Uh, it's a word that we're familiar with uh, what does incarnation mean? To become uh, material. Okay. The word carnate or carnal is flesh. Incarnal means to be in flesh. And so the incarnation is God, uh, the second person of the Godhead, taking on human flesh and becoming one of us. Uh, if you stop and think about that for a minute, you know, uh, if uh, I'll pick on Michael here for a moment, let's say that Michael dearly loved roaches and he saw that roaches were being murdered and poisoned by these professional bug killers. And so uh, he designs a plan to rescue them. In order to do that, he has to become a roach himself and to go into their world. Now, I've never had anybody said, that sounds like fun. Everybody kind of cringes at that. But now imagine the gap is even wider between God becoming a man. And there's probably nothing in scripture that is harder for us to understand than the incarnation. And I, I have some sheets. Uh, in fact, uh, one of our guys went to make some copies. I left the copies that I made on my copy machine, but they won't do you uh, much good right now. Uh, in the incarnation, I want you to think of it in terms of this. The author, God, writes himself into the drama. 
he not only is writing the play, this drama, and directing it, but now he's going to have the central role as the spokesman, you know, as the actor who's going to bring all of the things that have been happening to a climax. And again, I want you to notice it's not just it happened that way. That's the way all of these things have been designed to get us to this point. And what happens is that God, God the Son, takes on human flesh and becomes theanthropos. Uh, how many are familiar with that word? Have you heard that before, theanthropos? Theos is the word for God. Anthropos is anthropology is the study of man. So theanthropos is the God-man. And we have something that's unlike anything else that exists in uh, all of creation and that is the God-man, Christ in the flesh. And we're going to take some time to look at that tonight. I want to just remind you that throughout the Old Testament, I began looking at this, we would have taken our whole time just to trace the predictions, the prophecies of that, that uh, uh, God is going to come in the flesh. Now, I want to pick two words, and I put them up here. Actually, um, we're a little bit out of focus. Can, can somebody check that and see how we bring that into focus? I didn't look at that. It's kind of fuzzy. It's looking all right back here. Is it looking okay? Yeah, it looks okay back here. Okay. Okay, as long as you can see it. Um, notice I put the phrase up there, the Messiah King. You know, it's a way that we capture the idea of the kingdom that's developing and the word Messiah, uh, what does that mean? The one that God has chosen, selected, the anointed one. And so all of this uh, that is going to happen is prophesied in Scripture. Now, I'm not going to have you turn to the passages. It'll take us too long. I want to remind you of them. You remember when Jacob uh, gives the blessing for each of his sons, he talks about Judah, that a scepter will not depart, that, that out of Judah is going to come one who is to be the ruler. Uh, we have uh, one of my favorite passages is Balaam. You remember Balaam is hired to curse Israel, and instead he blesses them three times, and then the fourth time is kind of a freebie. And in the context of that, he says a star is going to come out of Jacob, and the scepter is not going to depart. And it's a from a, a, a non-Christian holy man, uh, you have this great statement of truth. Isaiah chapter 7, what's the verse in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14? Now that's chapter 9, you're two ahead. Chapter 7, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which is God with us. Uh, and Isaiah is pointing forward to the virgin birth. In Isaiah chapter 9, okay, Caleb, what's that now? Uh, <laughs> unto us a child is born, the government will be upon his shoulders, he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, uh, and it points forward to one who's going to come as king. When we come, and I want to ask you to turn with me in your Bible to the book of Luke, we're going to look at some of the Gospels. Again, I'm assuming that you have a pretty good knowledge of the content of this. So we're not looking, we can't go through all the passages, but I want to allude to them. The, the prophecy of this coming king, this coming Messiah, one of the most uh, gripping to me is the account of Zacharias and Elizabeth. You remember Zacharias is the prophet. Uh, I mean, he's the priest, and he goes in to offer the sacrifice, and there the angel comes to him and says that he and Elizabeth are going to have a son, and he essentially is going to announce the arrival to, to open the way for the Messiah to come. Immediately following that, in Luke chapter 1, we have this young woman named Mary, 
that uh, the angel Gabriel comes to her. I want to read a couple of these verses. Verse 30 of Luke 1. Do not be afraid, Mary, you found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He'll be great and will be called Son of the Most High. He'll be called that because that, in fact, is what he is. The Lord God will give him what? The throne of who? His father, David. We've been looking at David. You see the line going through here. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Again, exactly what he said in 2 Samuel 7. Mary says, how will this be uh, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, there's probably no statement in Scripture that is more powerful and yet more enigmatic than that. How does an incorporeal God, a God that doesn't have a body like we have, how does that God bring about through the womb of the Virgin Mary, uh, a new life that is both human, on the one hand, a real human being nurtured of Mary's substance, and yet the second person, the Son of God, how does that all come together? And I love the way this statement is made because it tells us enough, but it doesn't go into the specifics in a way then I think it's improper for us even to try to penetrate behind that veil. There are just some things that we don't know about that. But what we do know is Mary, this young virgin, is the very one that Isaiah talked about in Isaiah chapter 7, and the scripture makes it crystal clear. And Mary's response to this is, uh, verse 34, how will this be? since I'm a virgin. The spirit, uh, the angel said, the spirit will come upon you. Uh, then he goes on to say, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I love Mary's response. Instead of saying, I'll get back to you on this, or let me think about it. What does she say? May it be to me as you have said. She gives her consent to this. And then Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. You remember what happened? As soon as Mary shows up, the baby in Elizabeth's womb jumps and, and that baby is filled with the Holy Spirit. We know uh, from the, the, the text that that is John the Baptist who is going to go before Christ and announce the way. Uh, when I think of John the Baptist, uh, there is a uh, a TV personality that I always think of. You remember Ed McMahon? <laughs> what was Ed McMahon famous for? Johnny Here's Johnny. I mean, that's all he ever did. I mean, he never danced, he didn't sing, he didn't tell stories. He just announced Johnny coming on. Well, in a sense, that is John the Baptist's role. Uh, not saying, here's Johnny but saying, Johnny's saying, here's Jesus. You know, uh, he is bringing us to that point. This passage is absolutely critical in taking what it says to uh, Elizabeth and Zacharias, what it says to Mary. You remember in Matthew chapter one, Joseph has concerns. It becomes obvious that his bride-to-be, his betrothed wife, actually at that point, it's a little different than we have now, is pregnant. He knows he's not the father, and so he's thinking the only thing to do is I need to quietly divorce her, put her away, and while he's asleep, an angel comes and says, don't do that. You know, she hasn't been unfaithful, but this is my doing, and Joseph takes Mary as his wife. Now think about Joseph explaining that to his friends. I know what it seems like, but actually, you know, she hasn't been unfaithful. This is God's doing. 
Mary and Joseph both have a huge story that they have to be able to tell and they have to be able to defend. At the very point uh, in, uh, in Matthew 1, as he talks about uh, the birth of Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, whenever you see Christ, that's what it's saying. And in verse 21, she'll give birth to a son. You're given the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child, will give birth to a son. They'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so Joseph, it was a message about the coming Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. You remember the, uh, in chapter 2, you go to the account of the Magi. They came to Herod and they asked one question. You remember what it was? Where is he who has been born, what? King of the Jews. He, they use that very language. Now that's not the thing that Herod wants to hear because what a position does he occupy right now? You know, he's the king. So if there's another king born, that doesn't bode well for Herod, and he does everything he can to suppress that. And you know the story. The uh, angel sent them back a different way. He went to the region and had all the babies killed two years and under. But I want you to notice again, the Magi is talking about the one born king of the Jews. No, his name could have been Ted or Fred. He would have still been the same. Uh, it, it's not uncommon when you look at the kings in the Old Testament, like father, like son, you know, and, and it's, it's easy to get confused with the different Herods because there are about three or four generations of Herod uh, that you, you have to sort out, but none of them were good characters. They were, uh, they were all a mess. When you come to Luke 2, let's go back to Luke 2. We're still looking at the point at which uh, uh, the, the, the promise is made. At this point, we come to uh, the angels coming to the shepherds. You know the account. Jesus is born. Uh, the event happens in the first few verses of chapter 2. And uh, the angels of the Lord appeared to them. This is verse 9. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that shall be to all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord, Yahweh. Now, there's a number of things. David, Savior, Messiah, Yahweh, that is big news. You know, when uh, a royal birth, you may have been followed uh, uh, the uh, English royal family and the first baby, and now there's another baby on the way. That's big news. Well, this is bigger news than that. You know, that, that here it is that uh, uh, the angels are talking about this child that was born that's connected to David, that is the Messiah, that uh, is the Lord, that is a Savior. Now, how? that's a big uh, 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 list of things that you have to live up to, and that's the message of Scripture. If you go to the account of Simeon and Anna, remember Simeon, uh, when he held Jesus in his arms, he said, now let my, your servant depart in peace. My eyes have seen your salvation. And here was a recognition that everything God had promised him, he wouldn't die until he saw the redemption of Israel coming about. Well, here it is in the person of Jesus Christ. Anna, remember this is the, the widow for years who'd been in the temple praising God, didn't leave the temple. And when she took this child and saw uh, this child, uh, uh, what's her words here? Um, 
She never left the temple, verse 38, coming up to them at that very moment. She gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. You see all the pieces that are coming together, all of these things that have been happening throughout the years are pointing to this. I love the statement in 2 Corinthians, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. This is actually the heart of it. Now, I don't have the sheets for you, hopefully they'll be here momentarily, but the, the scripture uh, is a record, it records for us events that actually happened, okay? It, it's not like uh, the Lord of the Rings, you know, it's not like uh, uh, Superman and Batman and all these stories that are made up. Something, in fact, look at he is right, I'm just getting to that part, please, right in the nick of time. Yeah, you're, you're in charge of punching your own holes. Make sure you punch your holes and not your neighbor, okay? Uh, this is some material about the incarnation. Uh, and there really are five things that uh, all come together in the incarnation. That, that when Christ came, that's the event we have the report of that in scripture. That's what the gospels are doing. They're reporting what happened. Matthew and Luke uh, have much more to say about the actual events than Mark and John. And, uh, and then, uh, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And, and then you have John and you have Philippians and you have several other places that explain what does this all mean, okay? You get that something happened, there was a real event that took place. There was a child that was born to a virgin and angels showed up, it was a remarkable thing. The Bible records that, what happened, but it does more than that, it explains what does it mean. So what does this incarnation mean? And when we talk about incarnation, in the early church, the great battle theologically was over the person of Christ, who is Jesus Christ. And there are five things about the incarnation that we need to understand. The first is the deity of Jesus Christ. And you'll see on, uh, uh, on the sheets that I've given you, we, we don't begin to have time to go through here, but I just want to point out the categories that the Bible clearly and explicitly assert the deity of Jesus Christ. Uh, we see it in so many ways. You remember Thomas, my Lord and my God. Uh, here is a, a powerful statement. We see that in Philippians 2, who being in very nature God, did not consider uh, equality with God's hood something that he had to hang on to. Uh, we see the divine names that are applied to him. You'll see a list of those. Divine attributes are ascribed to him. Eternal existence and omniscience and omnipresence. Uh, he speaks of Christ doing divine things, things that no one else could do. He can speak to the water <coughs> where there's a raging storm and it goes silent. Remember, Jonah and the sailors couldn't do that, you know, in the book of Jonah. Jesus speaks to them and they say, what kind of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Well, it's God. You know, that is God himself. Uh, I, the scripture gives Christ the honor of being divine. You see a number of places. Uh, uh, I, I put a list of uh, seven or eight things from Thesan, and I think this is something we're pretty familiar with, and so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in here. The New Testament sets out without equivocation that this child that's born is divine. Okay, any questions there? We good with that? The second thing that it sets out is this is a real human being, a real body, a real human soul. This is a real human being. 
It's not as though Christ, the Spirit, just came and took over somebody else's body. But in fact, this is a real human body. That has to be factored into the equation. And many of the early heresies in the church, we're going to talk about those in a minute, it's just a, a series of affirmations and denial of these five things. And Christ has a true body. It's not uh, uh, an immaterial body. It's not just the appearance of a body, but it's a real human body. He got tired. He got thirsty. And all of the things that we experience, he experienced because he had a real human body. He was subject to the limitations that we have in having a human body. But not only did he have a human body, he had, number two, a true human soul or spirit. Now, it's really important that you get this. It's not just that Jesus came and took a human shell, a body. He didn't take a body, but in fact, we have this hypostatic union of God and man. So he has a real human soul. You can look at some of the evidences of that. That brings us to the third part. I forgot to put that up here. The deity of Christ is one part we must affirm. The humanity of Christ is the second part that we must affirm. Now we come to the hypostatic union. Now I know that sounds like something they do at a transmission shop, but that's not what we're talking about. What is the hypostatic union? Anybody tell me? No. <laughs> uh, and in fact, what it's going to say clearly is there is no union. Uh, what it's trying to uh, express, you'll see it here, it affirms that the human and divine are together in one person. So the hypostatic union is trying to explain how God and man are together in, uh, in, in one person, in one personality, Jesus Christ. And you understand how people, they begin to struggle to get all of this. How does that work? Uh, uh, almost every statement affirms the unipersonality of Christ. We're going to come to that in a minute. But the problem becomes uh, the, the, the hypostatic union. How is it that these two uh, uh, are one? Let me walk through this so that you, you get a clear understanding. In Christ, there are two natures, divine and human, and so there is a union of some sort. Uh, the, the language that they're going to use, we're going to read some of the creeds in a moment. You're going to see how careful they are in the wording that they choose. And the relationship, how many of you are familiar with the term the communicatio idiomatum? In fact, I have to tell you the story. I was uh, talking about this with our two associate pastors. I said, uh, Zach and Mickey, I said, are you familiar with the communicatio idiomatum? I said, oh yeah, we talk about that all the time. I said, well, good, then enlighten me on that. And they had this big smile on their face. Caleb, what's the uh, communicatio idiomatum? Okay, communicatio is communication. The idiomatum is the, 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 the person. And, and there's a huge difference uh, in uh, uh, the Catholic tradition. Their view is that the divine nature can be communicated to the human, and the human nature can be communicated to the divine. And the early creeds say, no, that can't be. You can't mix man and God. That's why the hypostatic union becomes so important. How did God and man come together without being intermixed and confused? So the communicatio idiomatum doesn't say that the divine communicates to the human and the human to divine. It says that the person, the unipersonality of Christ, can, we can affirm things that are both of divine or of human so that Christ is both omniscient, he knows everything, and he doesn't know the day or the hour. 
Now, is that, you know, a contradiction? No, it's recognizing the hypostatic union. You know, that, that as God, Jesus knows everything. Jesus can do everything. And one of the things that becomes really important is he secured our salvation. He resisted the devil because he was God and not just man, right? Wrong. He didn't do that because he was God. He did that as a man. And we sometimes say, well, of course he could do that because he was God. Well, this is what the hypostatic union is trying to say. No, everything that he did for our salvation was done as a man. And if God came in and did it, it's not going to work. It's not going to benefit us. And so the communicatio irmatum says we can affirm of the person, Jesus Christ, divine things. You know, he's able to walk on water. He's able to raise the dead. And human things, he sat on the well because he was thirsty and he was hungry. Okay? So we have God and man in this hypostatic union. They're brought together. But there's no transfer of attributes from one to the other. While there is a union, they are not mingled or confused. His divine doesn't ever become human. His humanity never becomes divine. They always remain intact as divine and human. And without separation. Without separation. They don't, they don't separate. That's right. And that's the word, what we're trying to get hold of with the word union. And so there is a union of the human and divine, no transfer of attributes, and this union is a personal union. Uh, it's not the mere indwelling. It's not that God came and uh, the Son came and indwelled. It isn't merely moral or sympathetic. You can read the rest of them there. Uh, as a result of this, number five, there's a communication of these attributes. Uh, we've talked about that already. Uh, and so he becomes the object of worship. Again, there's a lot of stuff here to think through, uh, and, and that's why I'm giving it to you in print to look at. The unipersonality of Christ. This is the fourth part. The unipersonality of Christ, it's not as though Jesus, uh, the man, and Jesus, the divine, had a conversation with each other, as though there are two separate persons there. Okay, it, we call this the unipersonality of Christ, that there is one person, and that person is the theanthropic person, the God-man. Uh, most all of them affirm that, um, and what it's saying is Christ is viewed in Scripture as one divine person. And whatever we can affirm of either nature, we can affirm of that one person. Uh, and we make clear that he didn't come and take over a human person, you know, take somebody that was already there, but that's what's happened uh, when Mary gave birth to him, and, uh, and what we deal with is a lot of mystery here. There are some things that we say, but there's a lot of stuff that we don't know. So let me pause here for a moment. I've thrown a lot of stuff at you. Questions, comments? I really don't understand how you can be all-knowing and fully God and grow the wisdom of the young guy and then not know the way everything. How is it possible? Okay, hypostatic union. <laughs> and the fact that you have God and man, and so what's affirmed of his uh, divine nature is true of that person. What can be affirmed of his human nature is true of that person. And again, we don't have anything else like that. You know, if you try to make the Trinity into an egg or, a, you know, a, uh, uh, water, uh, you know, ice, uh, uh, liquid gas, uh, uh, steam. Now, none of those things work. It's absolutely unique. And that's why in the early church there was so much debate about this. We'll, we'll come to that in a minute. David? That, you know, talking through that helps me to really understand fully appreciate more what it means when Scripture says that he was the second Adam, that as he, as he lived, life it wasn't because because he was God and he was able to resist 
travel because of his deity, but he did it as a man. As a man, absolutely. Uh, when we get to that back page, that council of Chalcedon, uh -huh. that, that will... Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna come to that in a second. Okay, Greg. The Hamasad Union really equips the Christians to do apologetics for the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses say that you know the Trinity is a man-made uh, mm -hmm. thing. It's um, uh, God. If God is omniscient, uh, then how can Jesus be God? He says, "I don't right. know." Him. And mm -hmm. If God cannot uh, be tempted, as the Old Testament says, yet Jesus was tempted. Tempted. Mm -hmm. The Hamasad Union. Is this in his humanity these things are true in his deity so we don't want to separate but we'll, so we want to keep them together without mixing so they're distinct that's right uh, yet together and, and the Hobbes had a union explains all these things from fully God fully man right. I like what Warren Wiersbe said uh, even though it's not with Warren but what he said is biblically true uh, he became what he never was and remained what he, ever what he always was <laughs> that's right uh, let's take a moment to talk about the kenosis. No, no area has had uh, uh, more issues around it than the word kenosis. Uh, it is taken from the Philippians 2 passage, he made himself nothing. And the view of many is that Christ emptied himself of his attributes, his deity, his power, his authority, but that's not what the kenosis means. Jesus did not empty himself of anything. Uh, he couldn't do that and continue to be the God-man. But the kenosis, what it says is he became a man. And if you stop and think about this, it wasn't, go back to our story with Michael, he's going to become a roach for a month to help the roaches get victory. No, he's going to become a roach through all eternity now. Jesus didn't become a man for the 30 plus years he was on earth. Who's seated on the throne right now? The Anthropos, the God man. He will always be man. That is a permanent, not a temporary uh, mode. Caleb? No, oh, okay. Uh, anyhow, we, we don't have time to go deep into the kenosis. There are uh, a lot of things there that are misunderstood. I do want you to turn to page eight and, and just to notice some of the creeds. I want you to notice we are so sloppy in the way that we use language. And what you're going to see with these creeds, it was so important, they're working very hard to be precise. The Apostles' Creed, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Now, not a lot in there. That's something we can all pretty easily affirm. The Nicene Creed. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Is that his deity or his humanity? Deity. What's that? Deity. His deity. The first phrase, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ. What's that? the unipersonality. There's, there's one person, uh, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds. What's he saying there? What's that a statement of? What's that? Deity, because he is eternally begotten. He wasn't begotten when Mary gave birth to the child. Okay, He is eternally the Son of God. God of God light of light, very God of very God. You see how they're stretching to find the words that will communicate. Jesus wasn't like God. Jesus is God. Begotten, not made. If Jesus is made, is he the creator or is he a creature? He's a creature. So you go to the Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, uh, you go to uh, uh, the uh, New World Translation, is it? And, you know, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was a God. And there's good reason to show why that's an error. But anyhow, begotten, not made. <coughs> Being of one substance with the Father. That's the what of the Trinity, what God is by whom all things were made, creator. There is his divinity. 
who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven. Forget this idea of climbing up into heaven and storming the gates of heaven. God came down, heaven came down, and glory filled our soul. The hymn writer had it right. For our salvation came down and was incarnate, put in flesh by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. You say, well, that settles it all. No, go to the symbol of Chalcedon. We then, all with one consent, that's their way of saying we all agree to this, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead, that's his what? His deity, and also perfect in manhood, that's his humanity, truly God and truly man, there's a hypostatic union, of a rational soul and body, that's the humanity, consubstantial with the Father according to the Godhead, that's his deity, consubstantial with us according to his manhood, that's his humanity, in all things like unto us without sin begotten before all ages of the Father, according to the Godhead, and in these latter days for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary. Now do you get that? Begotten eternally of the Father, born of the Virgin Mary at the fullness of time. One and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten. See how they're piling up words? To be acknowledged in two natures. Now watch this next phrase, because this is, is uh, used over and over again. Inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. Okay, that's the hypostatic union. These two natures, they're not confused, they're not changeable, they're not divisible, they're not separable. He puts the in on there. The distinction of the natures being by no means taken away by the union. You see how the hypostatic union comes in? We want to preserve that. But rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one subsistence. There's the unipersonality of Christ. Not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son and only begotten God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it sounds like it's just a redundancy of words. Come on, just say it the way they did in the Apostles' Creed. But they're saying this because of the heresies that come up. Let me point you to one other, the Athanasian Creed. It's necessary to everlasting salvation that he believed rightly the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, did you hear that? If you're wrong on this, you can't be saved. You know, this is one of the cardinal truths, a person that denies the deity, the humanity, the person of Jesus Christ, they cannot be a Christian. Uh, it is necessary to everlasting salvation. For the right faith is that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man, God of the substance of the Father, begotten before the world, man in the substance of his mother born in the world, perfect God and perfect man, of a reasonable soul and human flesh subsisting, equal to the Father as touching his Godhead, inferior to the Father as touching his manhood, who although he be God and man, yet he's not two, but one Christ, one not by conversion of the Godhead into flesh, that would confuse it, but by taking of the manhood into God, one altogether, not by confusion or substance, but by unity of person, for as the reasonable soul and the flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ. Now your assignment for next week is to memorize each one of those, and uh, we'll check and see how well you do. Uh, I want you to just take a, uh, I'm just kidding with that, by the way. Uh, the other sheet that I put here, uh, many of the ancient heresies, the Arians, the Apollinarians, uh, uh, any T.D. Jake fans here? I know uh, Daryl's a big fan of T.D. Jake's. Uh, uh, they are modalistic monarchians. 
And what you're going to find, each of those different views uh, are going to deny or affirm one of those uh, uh, things in regard to the deity of Christ. I have included the kenosis because that's too confusing. But you see, the, the, for instance, the Arians deny the true deity of Christ. They deny the true humanity of Christ. They deny the hypostatic union, but they affirm the unipersonality. And what you're going to see, each of those heresies is just affirmations and denials of different patterns of those four things. What identifies an orthodox Christian is they believe in the humanity and the deity and the hypostatic union and the unipersonality and the kenosis of Christ. And that was a battle that they fought because nothing is more important than understanding who Christ is. If we go wrong there, everything else is going to be wrong, okay? And so, again, much, much more that we could plow through in this, but I don't think it serves our purpose here, but I did want you to have that in hand. Go back and read through that. You know, we come back next week. If you have questions, we'll look at that. Uh, I talk about the Christological controversies. I mentioned that already. It's just the denial and the affirmation of that. The Church Creed set that out, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, and so forth. Now, the second thing, that I, the first part that I want you to see is what happened in the actual incarnation of Christ. I would love to have an hour to go to John 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, without God. Uh, that passage opens up what that means. The Word became flesh and came and lived in our neighborhood. That's what this is really all about. That this one that eternally is God, now what happens? He becomes a man. And he moves into our world and he tabernacles. That is, he sets up his home. It's not just a passing visit, but he comes and tabernacles here. Now, the second thing that I want you to see, now, Jesus did a lot of things throughout his life. We're not talking about his life and ministry, his miracles, his teaching, and so forth. Uh, uh, we can't do that in detail, but I want you to look at one thing to follow the pattern through. What about the kingdom? The fact is the Messiah King inaugurates a kingdom. This thing has been building, it's been promised, you know, there was a kingdom under David and Solomon and the rest of the kings, but there's something they're always waiting for, for the true king to come up and, and set up a kingdom that's never going to end. And you remember the passage from Isaiah 9? Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. It says the same thing to Mary. Now, what we have in the scripture is that John the Baptist, the very one that uh, uh, we read about earlier, the son of Zacharias and Elizabeth, uh, as he comes into his ministry, what was his central message? Look on the board. <laughs> the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The very thing that we've been waiting for, it's right at the door, it's ready to be inaugurated. So when John moves out of the way and Jesus moves in, you know what he says? Now the kingdom is near. He says the kingdom is here. Uh, how do you know the kingdom is here? Well, if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, you know, uh, then uh, it doesn't make any sense. But if I do this by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. By the way, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, are not referring to different things. It's just different terminology to refer to the very same reality. So Jesus came to inaugurate this kingdom. And that message is throughout Scripture. Uh, in John 3, uh, when he talks about the new birth, except a man is born again, he can't what? Enter into the kingdom. Unless he's born again, he can't see the kingdom. Uh, Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness is at the very center of it. At the crucifixion, what was the sign on top of the cross? 
king of the Jews. They wanted to change that and says, well, uh, he says he's king of the Jews. And Pilate says, no, what I've written, I've written. Uh, you remember uh, at uh, uh, the interrogation and Pilate asked him, are you a king? Remember what he says? You're right on. Yes, it's as you say. I am a king. This is the very reason I come. If my kingdom were for here, there'd be a big war right now and we'd win. But it, it's not time for that yet. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he preached the kingdom. Very last book, uh, I mean the very last chapter in the book of Acts that summarizes Paul's ministry. Uh, let me read it to you just very quickly. Acts chapter 28 and verse 31, boldly and without hindrance he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. That was central to his ministry. We come to the book of the Revelation. Again, I'm just skipping through. It's the return of the king. The king is coming back and he's going to bring all of these things together. And so I want you to see that not only does something happen in that the God uh, uh, man comes into being, the second person of the Godhead becomes a human being, becomes the God man, but he does things and he says things. And at the heart of this is the establishment of a kingdom. Now, one of the critical things that take place, we could literally spend days going through this, it's the fact that the Messiah King conquers. And he's not going to do that through chariots and horses and spears. He's going to do that through redemption being accomplished. I remember when I was in seminary, I was probably uh, 23, 24 years of, old, years of, uh, of age at that point. And I read this book by uh, 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 John Murray, Redemption Accomplished and Applied. And what a powerful book. I can't tell you how much that encouraged me. In Isaiah chapter 53, one of the most important passages in the Old Testament, the suffering servant. Uh, what's he going to do? Uh, we read Isaiah 53 and we see what happened to Christ when he went to the cross and we say, absolutely remarkable. You remember at the Last Supper, Matthew chapter 26, verse 17, what is the Last Supper? What are they observing? Passover. And he takes the Passover, everything that captured, that was the covenant meal of the Mosaic Covenant, and he transfers that over now to the Lord's table. On Sunday, we said, this is the body, my body, which is given for you. This is the blood of the new covenant. Uh, drink you all of it. You know, and so at that very point, he's taking all of the old and he's taking it in a new direction. In the Garden of Gethsemane, you remember, Lord, if it's possible, take this cup from me, yet not my will be done, but your will be done. And what you see again is the passion of Christ as he's going. He, he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful to the point of death. In fact, he was sweating blood. It was so intense. And he was facing hell itself. And that's not a figure of speech, that's reality. At the arrest and the trial, remember there's a big deal about him being king. And he is arrested and he's accused of sedition and they said, we have no king but Caesar. You say, where are they coming from? They said, well, his blood will be on our shoulders. Charge this to our account. That's about the king. At his crucifixion and his death, again, I'm assuming you know the account in, uh, uh, in, in Matthew, that's where all of these passages are, are, are taking place. In the crucifixion and death, he comes to the point, no one takes his life from me. He wasn't dragged to the cross. Uh, he willingly went there because that was his purpose. And he defeated this world. I often talk about a Rambo gospel. I like Rambo. I like somebody that kind of knocks heads around and justice is served. But Jesus is not a Rambo savior. 
rather than banging heads with somebody else and clobbering them, he absorbs all of the justice. Again, it's not the Jews who killed him, and it's not the Romans who killed him, and it's not us who killed him, it's the Father that brings that sword to bear. You remember uh, uh, Abraham and Isaac, and he has the, 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 a knife raised, and God stops him. But there's no one here to stop the hand of this father. And Jesus Christ dies, not by mistake, but he dies as a sacrifice, this great exchange that takes place. In fact, a very interesting passage, bodies of holy people were raised, and they were going about Jerusalem. You can read that in Matthew 27. What happens? The burial of Jesus Christ. He's dead. He's executed by uh, the Jews and by the Romans. He's buried. He's put in a tomb. They have to do it hurriedly. And the point of this is he hasn't swooned on the cross. He's really dead. This is a dead body in the tomb. We come to the resurrection three days later. And again, I'm, I'm briefly telling the story of what happens as he conquers this. The resurrection is the vindication that Jesus is who he said he was and that Jesus has accomplished all that God assigned for him to accomplish. The resurrection marks the movement from the state of, of humility now to the state of exaltation. Now he takes and, and rips the doors off death, and he comes back to life. In Romans 1, it talks about the gospel of God. Uh, it's the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ, who through the flesh was descended from David, but who by the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God. And the point of that is he was declared not powerfully, but he was declared to be the Son of God with all power, all authority given to me in heaven and earth. That takes place in the resurrection. Well, but that's not the end of the story. He's raised from the dead. We have to see his exodus. In fact, the, the scripture uses that very word. Uh, in, uh, uh, in any drama, you have entrances and exits. Well, the entrance for Jesus was the incarnation. We're going to see the exit that takes place here. After his resurrection, he appears to many different people. You can read that in uh, John 20 and not, uh, that should be 1 Corinthians 15. It gives account of all the people that Jesus appeared to. And then what happens? He ascends into heaven. Uh, this cloud lifts him up. It's interesting that only Luke records that in Luke 24 and in Acts chapter 1. I think that there is a decidedly uh, uh, marked failure on the part of evangelicals to appreciate the ascension and how important that is. Because if it ends with the resurrection, we don't get all the way there. We're at third base, but we're not home yet. Uh, what happens after the ascension? He goes into heaven, and I think this is the heart of everything. What happens then? He what? Not yet. The first thing he does is he has to go into the holy place. You know, people look at on the cross, tetelestai, it is finished. They say it's done. Well, that part is done. But it's not done, and I, I wish that we had uh, uh, time to uh, go into the passage in Hebrews 9. In fact, turn with me there for a moment. We at least need to highlight a couple of these verses there. Could Jesus have legitimately offered a sacrifice at the temple? Yes or no? On earth? No, why not? No standing. He wasn't a Levite. He was from the tribe of Judah. But there's another priesthood, and that is Melchizedekian. And Hebrews talks about that. And the picture that you have 
in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 9 is verse 11, when Christ came as the high priest of good things that are already here, listen now, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, not part of this creation. He's not going into the temple, he's going into the temple in heaven that was the, the, the reality on which the one on earth was modeled. And he goes there, and you remember in the Old Testament when the, the priest sacrificed the blood, was that the end of it? Was it finished? He took the blood and what did he do with it? He took it in and sprinkled it on the mercy seat. So what Jesus does when he ascends is he goes into heaven and there on the real mercy seat, he pours out the life that he's given up. And it's at that point that our redemption is secured and it's finished and it's complete. And then what does he do? Then he sits down. You know, I, I was struck as I, I looked at uh, uh, the passages uh, four times in Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, says, after he had provided purification for sins, that's what he's doing when he's going into the holy place, he sat down. If you go to chapter 8 and verse 1, it says the point of what we are saying is this, we don't have such a high priest, uh, we do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary.